Good evening. We will call to order the meeting Monday, the January 23rd, 2023 of the Corte Madera Parks and Rec Commission. Please stand and salute the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I know we're we're just getting it backwards. We got a we got all the words in most of the right order. Um, Rebecca, will you please do roll call? Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Here, Commissioner Elson. Here, Commissioner Kenick. Here, Commissioner Phipps. Is absent. Commissioner Rose here. Uh, Commissioner Blumling is absent. Um, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Charlie is absent, and Chair Miles here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we start with the items on our agenda, we'll open it up to public comments. Members of the public will be given three minutes apiece and can either raise a hand or email public comments to public comment at tcmmail.org. We are getting the timer into the meeting. Okay, um, we do have a raised hand from uh, an attendee online and James Jordan, I will unmute you and you can provide public comment for three minutes. Mr. Jordan, can you hear me? Yes, I just oh. unmuted you. Good evening. Thank you. I was unable to attend your December 5th uh, meeting, but I watched the uh, video of it recently and I was pleased to see that the athletic field subcommittee uh, favors pursuing uh, the installation of a natural turf field as opposed to an artificial turf field, but there has not yet been a, a vote of the uh, Parks and Rec Commission on that topic. And I believe one of the commissioners is going to talk to the mayor about uh, possibly funding such an endeavor. I sent uh, two um, statements to you today. One is a review of uh, uh, information on the internet from uh, year 2022 about uh, artificial turf. And I think the great weight of uh, evidence indicates that there are significant uh, health issues with the artificial turf fields. Uh, they uh, result in more uh, injuries to players. Um, and so I would appreciate you looking at that. And the second statement <clears throat> was about um, April 28th, 2021, the California Department of Toxic Substances control, that's within the California Department of Environmental Protection, decided that they were going to put in their three-year plan to study artificial turf. Their interest is in protecting children from health risks, and they're also interested in um, trying to control the release of microplastics into the uh, water system. And they base their decision on a lot of uh, scientific information that raises concern about artificial turf. And so as this process plays out, so it's for year 2021, 22, 23, I think probably it's going to be about a year from now at the earliest before we learn the results of that study. If they find uh, health issues with artificial turf, then there's going to be a process following to uh, develop regulations. So I think that practically puts the town in a difficult situation in that 
it's unwise to spend three or four million dollars to begin to install an artificial turf uh, soccer field in the town park until the outcome of this study is, is found, um, released. And uh, so I think practically it's a bar to um, proceeding with uh, uh, thinking about installing an artificial turf field in, in the town park. And, um, and if we think into the future, if the field were installed and the report does come out and find there are these health issues, what does the town do then? And, and it could subject the town to increased liability. What if there are more injuries on the new artificial turf field? And what if the neighbors who are downwind from the new artificial turf field begin to develop health problems? It would be a real morass for the uh, town. So I think that's a situation better avoided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional raised hands and let me just check the emailed public comment. The commission did not receive any additional emailed public comment on this item. So, thank you to Mr. Jordan for his comments. Um, it is not an agenda item, so we are not able to take a vote, but the commission, as we discussed in our prior meeting, um, we are able to direct very specifically uh, staff um, to pursue natural turf kind of exclusively um, and to not look into artificial turf as part of the master planning if we are all still in agreement that that is the direction in which we would like to direct staff. Any dissent, change of minds? Okay, so we would, like to officially direct staff to pursue natural turf um, as we as we consider athletic field improvements. Um, Direction received. Thank you. Excellent. All right. If there are no more public comments, we are going to move on to presentations. Great. So, Corte Madera Habitat Garden um, invited to participate in the Sonoma Marin Water Saving Partnership Eco Friendly Garden Tour by Dana Swisher. Excellent. Going to pull up her presentation screen. Dana, do we need you with the mic? Do we can Let's make it real official. All the people here. can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you on the recording. I have two parents in the room. Mike. <laughs> so what I have to do is moderate my voice so I don't use my teaching voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, the eco-friendly garden tour, this is from their um, brochure. This is from the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. Um, Sonoma County and Marin County got together to work on initiatives uh, to support uh, water saving. And so one of their uh, events they do is an eco-friendly garden tour. It is a public outreach and education program that promotes sustainable landscaping practices by showcasing inspiring gardens throughout Sonoma and Marin counties. And the tour highlights a Russian river friendly and I think it says environmentally friendly landscaping and best practices. So the, the tour will be on May 13th from 10 to 1 p.m. This is going to be the 13th year of the tour. Um, it's the first year since COVID that it's in person. And um, they actually reached out to me to ask us to be on the tour. Um, ours would be one of, there's five gardens right now in Marin being showcased and ours would be the sixth and only public garden that's uh, being showcased. So um, they do a lot of promoting. They'll promote through their Facebook pages and their um, next door and their releases. They, when municipal water will also be promoting it. And then, we as a town can do the same thing, put it on our website and in our literature to get the word out. Um, and it's a, people sign up, they, it's self-guided. They're given the direct, the address and they, um, but they come on between 10 and one. I would be there with uh, Neil Cummins volunteers and uh, custodial staff from Larkspur School District. And uh, there is a liability release waiver that all participants sign before they go on the tour. So, 
So um, in case you're not familiar with the garden area that we're talking about, um, the first picture, that's from fall of 2021. That was, that's my dog Jasper looking at the landscape that used to be there, which was mostly European grasses and uh, fennel, which were both invasive species. And um, after planting in uh, fall of uh, May of fall of 2021, in May of 2022, that's what the landscape looked like with all the flowers in the middle. And then the future site, which is actually now planted, this slide is a little bit old. Um, you see the, the planted area, which is the landscaped area from phase one, phase two is the, the brown land in the distance. And so if you go to the next slide, um, so that has now been planted. And those are some of my students. <laughs> yes, from today. We went out today and they were doing their nature journals and they picked one uh, spot, one plant to be their special plant and spot that they're going to monitor over the course of the year. Um, but as you can see, it's been just newly planted and mulched. And hopefully in the spring, it will be blooming just like that last picture. And these are two more photos from, it just comes a lot. It just gorgeous in the springtime. So um, it just shows, these photos show how a public space has been transformed into a beautiful native plant garden that supports local wildlife, including monarch butterflies, native bees and birds. And not to mention that lots of people as they walk by, just enjoy it. It smells good, it looks good. So it's enhancing everybody's lives. And, um, these are just being finalized. These are two educational sign, um, sign, signs that are in process. And one is educating about the whole garden, what is in the garden, uh, different pollinators, the bees, and other insects. We're highlighting the monarch butterfly since they've been struggling. And Corte Madera is a very special location for the Western monarch because we're on their uh, migration trail. So we can provide breeding. Um, opportunities with milkweed and nectar uh, plants, which they need um, a lot of fuel be before they migrate both ways. So, um, and then the other one obviously highlights the monarch. And then this part of the tour is also gonna be the two gardens that are on the school campus. There's our Hawks garden, which um, has lots of food planting, you know, crops, tables for educational um, experiences, native flowers, and um, that's a pollinator section, which has fruit trees, native plants, and other pollinator plants. And then on the far side is the Monarch Way Station, which is planted with nectar plants and milkweed. I think that's the last slide. So anyway, we're looking forward to that happening on May 13th. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any commissioner questions before we open for public comment? Uh, I was just curious. Um, so during the tour, I mean, is that a possible opportunity to learn about um, planting um, native plants around residencies? Because it seems like you'll have a lot of folks there, including myself, that be interested in planting stuff around home that would help support monarch butterflies. That is definitely. Uh, that is, um, that is definitely. Um, one of the reasons they do the tours to educate the, pop, the public about what you can plant. And they also provide, I didn't mention it, they provide 20 to 30 um, plant signs to highlight certain plants that we, I already have um, labels out there, but they're going to give us even more. So Wonderful. yes, Thank you. please come. <laughs> Commissioner questions, reopen. Public comment. Is there any public comment on the presentation? Thank you, Chair Miles. I did not see any additional raised hands, and uh, we did not receive any emailed public comments on this item. Thank you again. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so 
Our next presentation is an update on the Corte Madera Parks and Recreation Scholarship Program by Tim Berry, our, our Recreation Program Manager. Hello and good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, so we're going to do a quick update on scholarship program. Ashley, can you bring up the uh, website so we can look at it? So we are um, fully launched with a website page on our website for the scholarship program. It wants to help and load. Let's see. There we go. Um, so all of our information that we've talked about, obviously through Commission Council over up here, um, it has all the information about the program, eligibility, and all the forms in both English and Spanish at the bottom, so people can easily access it. Um, just a little summary for um, the year we've gone so far. So since uh, July 1st, which started fiscal year, we've awarded almost $9,000 in scholarships, about 27 total people. Um, most of those were summer, because obviously summer is heavy in July. Um, since the installation of the new program, uh, we've been, um, awarded um, $3,600 total in scholarships, about 12 total um, students, and a large of their schools and families, obviously, because they're applying for either um, child care programs or after school programs. Um, we have had a great relationship with the district there, getting the information out to families who are in need. They've kind of been identified already in the pre and lunch. They're so like, hey, here's an opportunity. There's some funding. Please sign up for these programs. So, both for the kids who need single day, two days of after school program for childcare or the actual enrichment classes, they've been filling it out for us. Um, I get applications probably weekly, people looking for programs, which is great. Um, I haven't any adult applications yet, only youth, obviously, for most of the youth classes, which is what I expected. Um, our plan is the upcoming activity guide to do a half page of, hey, here's the new scholarship program, here's how you apply, and then two, here's how you can donate if you'd like to donate to the program. And then going forward, when the school menus get put out, same thing. Here is the opportunity to donate and obviously to apply for a scholarship um, for the per year. Uh, I anticipate when our summer guide goes live, we'll get probably a much more, many more applications um, for the program, but it's been well received. People are very thankful. Um, they love having it online, the writable PDF. They can fill it out, get it right back to me, and we're able to get people in programs. That is very exciting. I didn't see the donation process. Is that on the website yet or is that still coming? Uh, it is not on the website yet. It'll be in the um, brochure, but I can add it to the website for the donation process, yes. Are there any other commissioner questions? Just confirming that the if one was to donate, it will be tax deductible. Your accountant. Because um, we are not a 501c3. I was curious yeah. about that. But we do have a tax ID number okay. as a town. Can you remind us what the total scholarship fund is right now that you're working with? Uh, I have about left remaining balance, about $8,000 left. So we had some carryover from years past from the summer donations, and then we allocated some money in this year's budget to fulfill the immediate need we saw. So we have about 8,000 left to fill for the summer. Um, and that's just including um, the camps and classes, not the program we're doing with the school district for those 30 or so targeted students who are going to be in the three program or in summer school and then come into us after school. That's different funds. And town council hasn't been officially asked for additional money, which we had roughly talked about as being $10,000. And we haven't officially asked them to support the, the school district again for summer school, but they've already unofficially supported it. One more question. Do we um, give people the opportunity to donate to the scholarship fund when they're signing their child up or themselves up for a program um, with regular regular fees? Not yet, but we want to add that option. We need to figure out a way because most of our registrations are done online. So it'll take a little bit more work rather than adding just a button or a little box that you can check on a, on a, a paper form, which is kind of what we're used to doing. So we've got to think about a new way with our rec pro system. But yes, that's our intention. Thanks. Requesting funds from town council, is that something you need direction from the committee on, or is that something that you will do once the $8,000 has been awarded? Um, we're going to be doing it during the budget process, so we'll ask then. I think we've already received enough feedback from uh, from the commission at the commission level that we don't need an official action on that. But let me know if you'd like to do one otherwise. And just to clarify, we're still open to doing directed donations. If 
people want to spe specify a particular program in their donations to town. To yes. Town. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Are there any public comments related to Tim's presentation, Rebecca? I am waiting to see if we have any raised hands. Um, we did not receive any emailed public comments on this item. And I am not seeing any raised hands from online attendees. All right, moving on to our third and final presentation, update on athletic field maintenance by RJ, Director of Public Works. Hi, RJ. Hi there. Good evening, Chair Miles, Commissioner. Um, here to talk about just kind of what's been going on on the athletic field maintenance. Um, as you all know, we had several years of um, very dry um, weather, in particular uh, 2020 and 2021 were kind of historically lows. So um, that really posed a challenge for kind of our turf fields. And um, we definitely heard some feedback that we needed to kind of look at options to enhance, you know, how we attack this. And um, so staff over um, fall brought in some experts, um, some soil experts, some um, kind of seed experts and a couple contractors just to kind of brainstorm, you know, what we could do to, to further improve the fields, um, given they'd taken some, um, some, you know, the, the usual wear and tear, but didn't receive the, the amount of water they would normally receive. So um, just to give a little background, um, typically in the past, our team has done um, an annual air rating event where they would take out um, what we call plugs or, you know, kind of the, the soil plugs about the size of a cork. Um, and so that's still part of our annual process. And that's typically when we would also do our seeding. Um, and in the past, we've done that once a year. And um, that has been, I think, adequate. Um, but what we've done differently this year is also um, <clears throat> came up with a specific soil amendment that we added to, to each of the fields. And that was through sampling the soil and actually finding where it was deficient and kind of how, uh, what um, additives to bring in to give it the optimum chance of growth. Um, so that that's happened. We also um, brought in a, a five ton roller, much like you would see on a, on a paving job where it's rolling the road, but in this case, it's rolling the athletic fields. And so it rolled it a couple different directions. So that really smoothed out some of the minor undulations um, that you would just kind of see over time with um, fields that are built over kind of a historic marsh area. Um, the other thing we did is um, looked at, you know, as the year goes on, what are some of the options to do some kind of in-year or in-season maintenance? And some of the ideas and that we're planning to implement is <clears throat> instead of doing the air rating using that kind of wine cork plug size, um, we're gonna try something they call pencil tines. So it's about the, the width of a pencil. And if any of you are golfers, you may have seen it, um, you'll often see these kind of pencil radius or pencil diameter size holes, you know, in a green or on a, on a golf course. And mm -hmm. the, the beauty of that is it still allows the soil to, to bring in the oxygen and aerate and kind of loosen the soil. Um, but it's not very disruptive to play. And for something like soccer or lacrosse, we think it's virtually no disruption to play. Um, and so that's something we're going to experiment with. And we're going to plan on doing that um, probably once or twice this, this season. And also um, add in additional seeding events throughout the season um, <clears throat> just to really um, accelerate the amount of growth we see on the fields. Um, and then obviously uh, we've gotten... Uh, a large amount of rain so far, so things are, are shaping up in, in that regard. And um, I think overall, um, we're, we're in much better shape this year. So, um, you know, we're, we're optimistic, we're confident that um, the performance of the field is going to be um, a lot higher. And but obviously, we'll continue to monitor and make adjustments as needed. And so, with that, I can happy to answer any questions you have. Did the um, did the people you worked with have any suggestions on specific types of grass seed to use? Yeah, so um, 
I think in the past we've we've stuck to I think more of a rye blend, and so that is um, what we did on the first seeding event. But um, as we move into these kind of second and third feeding events, well, that's what they call them feeding um, seeding events or feeding events. Um, we will introduce a little more Bermuda. Um, that's an area I'm an expert in, but I, I, I'm told that Bermuda does um, kind of tend to be a little more durable, um, but maybe doesn't. Yeah, there, there's some trade-offs. I, I don't know if it grows as quickly as, as the rye, but it, it does um, tend to be more um, durable. So having the two, I think, I think is a good combination. I also am wondering, because we have the unique combination of drought where the, the grass dies off and we're trying to keep it alive. And then when it rains, the fields um, don't drain, you know, and is there anything, any advice they had or anything we could do maintenance wise to improve the drainage of the fields? Um, so some of the additives they looked at are some common materials that um, perhaps you know, like um, gypsum is actually one of them. And, and I think that has a, um, a benefit on, on kind of how the soil holds its moisture content. And um, there are a number of other additives that um, some sulfurs and other things similar that um, I think are designed to improve that. Um, as far as like surface ponding and whatnot, um, that's probably something that would involve either regrading or introducing some sort of um, French drain or drainage system. It's likely not going to substantially improve just by aerating and soil and amendments. Um, so that'd be a bigger investment and something that would have to be timed with um, a larger renovation um, type approach. Um, I had a, a quick question. Um, going back to uh, the types of grass, um, I remember reading that, you know, uh, way back when the initial grass was selected, it wasn't really typical grass for athletics and soccer. So I was just kind of curious, does the Bermuda and rye, is that a typical grass that um, folks put on um, high activity areas? <clears throat> yeah, so um, that was the feedback we received is that the rye, that, so we, we actually weren't able to um, do the aerating event last year. There were some challenges with just timing and staffing. And so we had some rye from um, from last week that we reused as part of this initial event and they said that's fine and they said just on the next one we'll just introduce some Bermuda as well into it so um, everything we're told is that those are um, acceptable and, and very appropriate for um, a field such as ours. Um, there might be some you know I don't know it's possible if you talk about you know, professional sports fields that they can water them every day you know you might be fall into a different class of of grass because the amount of attention and water that they can handle, but for something where we have limitations, um, every indication is that the, the Ryan Bermuda is, is, is appropriate. Thank you. Hey, RJ, just a quick question about the, I guess this is about the perimeter of the fields with all of the recent rain, if there's been any assessment of the safety of the trees. I'm thinking particularly of the eucalyptus trees, um, if any of them have been compromised with such a you know, such an infusion of water with shallow root systems and the wind that we had, do we have to worry about any trees coming down or any disease? Um, you know, our, our team was pretty active over the last few weeks. And really one of the, the main thing, the main team was saying was responding to trees down and other things. Um, in all honesty, we're, we're still catching up. Um, you know, the storm happens and you're in the moment and then you're kind of still kind of picking up the pieces. So that that's that that work is is continued and ongoing. So that's a good question that I'll have to look into. Okay. So I had a question, RJ, on um I've noticed some invasive weeds that are popping up. Did the did the grass folks have any suggestions on how to handle kind of the the dandelion spread or some of the other crabgrass spreads? Yeah, what I um, what I heard was, um, so by overseeding or overfeeding, yeah. you're kind of 
improving the numbers of the species of, of grass that you want to grow and then kind of reducing the, the chances of those other weeds to kind of thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's kind of the approach really is um, just kind of flood or not flood, but uh, inundate the area with more of the grasses you want um, to kind of overtake the, the invasives that you do not want. Uh, there's also some strategies with, and these are, this one's not new. This is one that our, our team has um, kind of implemented over the years, but there is a whole kind of approach to how high you set your mower. Um, and I can't tell you which if it's higher or lower, which is more favorable, but by adjusting the mower to the right height, it does have an effect on which grasses versus weeds will kind of thrive. The higher, the higher mower height will also help with water usage as well. And that was kind of my next question was on irrigation. How often are we irrigating the fields? Yeah, so um, we're still limited um, to two days per week of spray. Okay. And, I, and I don't know, um, I did reach out to the water district on another matter with respect to drip. And they've actually uh, made that, I think, of permanent ordinance on the, on the drip side, which is three days per week. Um, whereas, you know, for the past year or two, it was more of a drought regulation. And so it, I'll, I'll follow up and find out if that's also permanent to do two days of spray. But um, my guess is it probably is. Um, and then I'm not sure if this is an RJ question or actually if this comes back to us as we think about master plan. But to um, the questions around kind of we are gonna we're gonna feast or famine on the water, and so are there other strategies that we should be thinking about in terms of if we had more trees, would that soak up more water because they had more roots um, to help with the drainage problem in the times of flood? Are there types of like is there things like that that we could be thinking about that could help manage this kind of up and down swings from a climate perspective? And how do we think about that with master plan? Um, if that's more of a public works challenge or a master plan challenge, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure how that would fit into the master plan stuff. That's definitely not in my immediate wheelhouse. I would have to do some research in, into that. I'm not sure if RJ has any different perspective from, uh, from his scope. Um, you know, it's, it's a good question for us to ask kind of any specialists we bring in, especially if we were to embark on a, a larger scale kind of field maintenance or field renovation project. Um, I will say some of the lower hanging fruit, um, we've kind of um, reviewed and realized it's not a good fit. And then just one of them that, you know, some of our uh, inland agencies uh, may be able to take advantage of is like well water and whatnot, but given our proximity to the bay and the amount of salinity, um, that's not likely to be a, a very, um, productive option for us, even if we can generate um, water, if it's high in salt, it's going to do probably more harm to the grass and other things than um, not using it at all. Okay. Any other questions for RJ? Rebecca, do we have any public comment? I am refreshing the emailed public comment and while I'm doing that, we do have a raised hand from an online audience member, and I will call on Clark Miller. Mr. Miller, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, this is Clark Miller uh, with CMFC. Hope everybody's doing well. RJ, nice to see you. Sorry, I'm not on, on uh, screen, but I appreciate your responsiveness uh, this winter as we've been trying to better understand the maintenance program on the fields. Thank you for the update tonight. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I, I was not aware that the the fields, I think you said that they had not been aerated yet. Is that the case for both the East and West field or just one of them? I'll, I'll, I can answer that when you're done. Okay. Um, and it sounded like last year's rye was used, not the Bermuda yet. I just want to keep track of, of kind of what the maintenance program uh, actually is so that we can document whether that has been successful or not. Um, I additionally, I wanted to better understand when you think we'll start to see results from this. And 
Um, and if at that time there are certain adjustments that need to be made, um, if you have any recommendations of what that might look like, that would be interesting. Um, and then my last question is really for the commissioners, which is until we see those results, I wanted to better understand if there was a parallel path for determining what alternates could be feasible for particularly the east and west fields, and um, if there was any role that we could play in assisting those alternate plan efforts. That's it. Thank you. Um, would you like me to take those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, so right already, and, and thank you for the comments, Clark. And Clark's been in contact with myself and Ashley's staff, so thanks. Um, yes, we have completed the aerating um, and seeding on both the east and west field. That was done um, before the holidays. And um, that also involved the soil amendments and bringing in the topsoil. So the between the soil amendments and topsoil and bringing in the roller, I mean, right off the bat, we've um, probably spent close to $15,000 more than we would have in prior years. So I think, you know, that's that's a um, noteworthy amount of money that, that I just want us all to kind of recognize. And then um, as we move, and, and unfortunately, given the timing, you know, I don't think there's anyone out there that could have predicted um, the uh, atmospheric river that we received the last few weeks, but we, we probably will have to reseed and do uh, some additional topsoil just to make up for that um, heavy amount of rainfall. So that, you know, probably bumps us up over $20,000 just um, getting us kind of through this initial um, enhanced annual kind of event that, or annual maintenance work we're going to do. And then each one of these additional seedings that we're going to do, and I, and I think we're going to do at least one, if not two of these throughout the year with the pencil tine aeration, um, those are probably close to 10 grand each because just the seed alone is around $5,000. And then by the time you add in the labor and the equipment and everything. So um, I, I just want everyone to know that I feel like we're, um, you know, the town is stepping up financially to address um, some of the concerns from the public and, and obviously our, our sports um, field users. Um, and, and I think it's important to um, factor that in. Um, I, I think we want to, we're viewing this a little bit as a pilot project or a pilot program, right? You know, is this kind of the new model that we're going to adhere to and kind of, if so, then, you know, perhaps we'll, you know, look at the, the dollars kind of on a, a long, longer term basis, but um, you know we are we are looking at um, just on these additions of, of maintenance activities. You know anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand dollars worth of more investment in field maintenance. Um, and I'm not sure I was totally clear on what the second question was in terms of alternative fields, but we have alternative parks. Yes, but we are. There's nothing in the immediate term short of, there's nothing in the immediate term. No, I think, yeah, I think his question was maybe how could um, Corte Madeira FC support any additional improvements to the existing fields at Town Park? Yeah. Um, I think that's what he was saying. Um, and I'm not sure, I think right now we're, what RJ is saying that we're trying to try this pilot program, which is um, significantly more maintenance um, and cost and time um, than previous. And we're really hopeful that this is going to make an improvement and we want to see and, and evaluate what that improvement is going to be and then go forward. I know that we've also, with the master plan, we want to talk about, you know, if we're pursuing only options for natural turf, then we want to see, you know, what would be the long-term plan? Would it be, you know, a larger grading and resodding or seating or what that looks like from a consultant's perspective, mm -hmm. since they're the industry experts we're deferring this, um, a lot of this research to. Um, and so hopefully we'll have that information coupled with the results of this current um, pilot program to make a good decision and recommendation to council. I just want to ask one clarifying question. I think um, I'm going to echo a statement that Clark Miller made. In terms of timing to have a sense of whether this has been successful or not, how long does when once the new seating happens, 
when do we say, look, this, this is, we're moving in the right direction or we're not hitting the mark? Yeah, sorry, I missed that one. Um, so, you know, I, I think if we go out there now, we, you know, um, at least once it dries out, there, there should be regrowth that is already visible. Um, and then beyond that, right, in between any sort of maiden events, there's going to be um, field use. And, and obviously, as there's more field use, there's going to be um, more bare spots that are going to need attention. And then it's that's when we start thinking about doing our, another maintenance event and seeing how it responds and improves. So it, it is going to be a little bit of monitoring and kind of seeing how, the, how it goes. But um, I think if you go out there, you should see um, improvements already compared to um, late October, early November before any of this was done. And just to insert, I think, you know, unofficially we, we talked about maybe checking in it on maybe June, because we know that that's going to be started at the beginning of the warmer season and kind of see where we're at and re where the re regeneration is. And then in preparation, like if there's anything that we could do in preparation for the fall, which would start at the end of August, it could be done during that time. Since that's a low season time following 4th of July special event, if we needed to close the field for anything additional, we could at that time. And I know that that's been um, a part of RJ's thought process and research in this pilot program. Thank you. Thanks, RJ. It sounds like um, a really thorough plan. I'm excited um, that we're getting a lot more time and the extra seating and the the higher mowing and all of that. I, I, you know, from my understanding of how grass grows, um, are all the right things. So thank you for for taking that time and and investing more in it. Yep, absolutely. All right. That brings us to our final presentation. Moving on to the consent calendar. These are items that are routine or have been previously discussed and do not require any further discussion. Any member of the public is welcome to make a comment or pull, pull an item for the consent calendar for further discussion. We'll start by asking if anyone from the commission would like to pull anything from our consent calendar for discussion. Would anyone from the public like to comment on any item in the consent calendar? I am not seeing any raised hands and we did not receive any emailed public comments. All right. With that, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 5th meeting? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the December 5th meeting. I will second that motion. Rebecca, can we have a vote, please? Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Elson? Yes. Commissioner Kenick? Yes. Commissioner Phipps? Commissioner Rose? Yes. Commissioner Blumling, Vice Chair Charlie, and uh, Chair Miles? Yes. Thank you. Awesome. That brings us to tonight business items. Um, the first business item is just discussion and possible action to recommend the town park restroom project Yay. to the planning commission for consideration. Thank you very much. And I just want to recognize that um, RJ from Public Works is um, on the call for the, or on the Zoom for this topic, as well as uh, Steve Myler joining us from Public Restroom Company. So from the, the maintenance and technical first perspective, as well as from the um, perspective contractor, we'll be, we should be able to answer any questions that we have here uh, beyond my scope and understanding. Um, but a little background, improving the public restrooms in Town Park is supported by Town Council, staff, and the community. Town Council prioritized it in improving public restrooms in Town Park by identifying it as a Category 1 priority in their 2022 annual work plan, and the community advocated, it, advocated for replacing of temporary restrooms with a permanent solution during our master plan community engagement sessions that were held between 2020 and 2021. Um, action taken by staff to support improving the public restrooms in Town Park um, includes um, applying and receiving a grant to help fund the new facility, making restrooms more available at the community center, and pursuing procurement of a new facility. And then related to procuring the new restroom facility, town staff has held a project dedicated public workshop, and that was in October of 20, October 26 of last year, um, to obtain the additional feedback on restroom location, standard amenities, aesthetics and security and anti-vandalism features. And then we brought that to the commission level um, and we made uh, available for a continued public public comment. And that's at the Town Park Restroom Project. Then that link to that website that's dedicated um, on the project page of the Public Works Department is included in the staff report. Um, and so at the October 26th um, meeting or October 26th recap of the workshop, we held um, 
uh, additional information to the commission on our November 7th meeting. Uh, the commission was asked to review and discuss the summarization of that workshop um, and to receive additional feedback um, regarding preferred location design features and the proposed restroom facility and potential restroom uh, supplier, which is public restroom company. Um, no final decisions were regarding location or design were requested during that meeting, and the community was again encouraged to review documents, the workshop recording, and provide additional feedback. Um, next steps outlined by the commission on November 7th was that staff would um, engage public restroom company, which we did, um, to create a few design options to incorporate the preferred design features and location identified through our feedback. And then tonight, um, staff has the opportunity to present the discussion, discuss recommended design options um, by the public restroom company and request the commission consider recommending the town park restroom project to the planning commission for consideration. Should the Parks and Rec Commission make this recommendation, staff will prepare the town project report to accompany the recommendation as outlined by town uh, muni, muni code. Um, discussion tonight, um, if you could discuss and recommend our locations, design, and operational hours. Each of these topics is needed to be defined in order to, for staff to complete the town park um, town project report for the Planning Commission to review. Um, location. Location options were initially discussed during the master planning community engagement sessions in 2020 and 2021, again in October 26th of 2022, and then at the November 7th Parks and Rec Commission. Um, town staff support the location that was identified as the preferred location at the 20, in 2022. And that is um, the recommended location is at the end of the community center parking lot on Eastman. So it's tucked in between the three trees there and the existing first baseline of the uh, ball field. And the proposed facility is centrally located to serve users of the basketball court, softball diamond, dog park, parking lot, and is between both the west and east soccer fields, essentially serving the central and eastern areas of town park. And that's minimal green space would be needed as location is partially paved. There is an existing water fountain that could have a water utility connection. Um, however, the sewer injector, injector system would be required and will increase the project cost based on that location. And those were all factors that were contributed in the conversation at the, our November meeting. And there's a link to um, the map for this list, this site, as well as a picture. Um, as far as design, staff provided a, a present a representative of public restroom company, Steve, who's on the line with us, um, a summary of the feedback from the community engagement and the Parks and Rec Commission and included desired design features and location. And that's also included as attachment one. Um, and just to quickly go through that summary, we've got a bullet points um, in the staff report service for up to six individuals at a time, and that was to replace the existing temporary facilities that we have um, and then provide single occupant accommodations, access to restrooms from multiple sides of the building, sensor flush systems, sensor faucets, stainless fixtures, hand dryers, glass mirrors that can be replaced with stainless if vandalized, interior baby, baby changing stations, interior hooks, interior um, retractable step stools, um, natural light and air vents, AD accessibility, LED exterior lighting, two exterior drinking fountains with a bottle filler and a pet fountain, exterior hand washing station, timed automatic door lock system, a mop sink and utility chase for maintenance, minimal storage for maintenance needs, um, a standing seam, uh, standing seam roof metal, which is used by 95% of the public restroom company clients and two modular units. And Steve can speak to that a little bit more, but um, how the public restroom company comes uh, for our size and capacity that we want to serve, it would be two modular units. So we have a little bit less of flexibility of how wide the facility might be based on that modular system. And then moving into our preferred design that staff is going to recommend today is option A. Um, and of the four designs, uh, option A and B are both hybrid facilities um, offering a single occupant and multi-occupant access. Um, both options utilize the same floor plan but have different roof styles. Staff repaired the gable roof in option A with a covered entry and a wood and steel truss that's in, in the image. Um, staff repaired the gable roof in the option A with, um, let's see, it because it matches the community center, promotes good light and airflow throughout the facility, and is 10 to 20% less than other styles of roofs. Um, the rending also includes uh, cedar siding, ledge stone wainscot, and um, cinder block alcove where the water fountains and hand washing station are. And there's a little bit um, better images of those. It's hard to get a really a good sense looking at the images that we've provided in the staff report. Um, I don't think it does justice as far as how you can see it in person. 
And I know that we can work with Steve and his design team to kind of refine a little bit more of it. I know that um, RJ's had some experience with um, making some renderings on a larger scale. So when we do a project display board on the site, we can make it um, uh, really detailed so people really know what they're looking at and providing um, public comments on. The floor plan is also included there. Um, and as you can see, this is a model that has the hybrid. So it has um, the traditional you know, men's and women's side. Um, the reason why we wanted to include that as well as the um, gender neutral family um, style restrooms with a single occupant is because it's a really efficient use of space um, when you have one toilet or one toilet or two toilets and one toilet and urinal using one sink that's obviously maximizing the space versus having one toilet one sink. <clears throat> Um, as, uh, let's see, staff notes that public restaurant company will provide finish and color options after design is refined or selected. Uh, staff plans to narrow options and create a storyboard at the location site to draw attention to the potential project and solicit additional feedback through emails to public comment or speaking at subsequent town meetings. And additional details are provided for all four options in attachments two and three, including a rendering with sample exterior finishes, floor plans, dimensions, and a brief description. Um, related to the operational hours that we need to address is that once the Parks and Recreation Commission makes the recommendation of the Planning Commission for consideration, staff needs to include that information in the town project report. Um, and the option of a time door lock was discussed at the project workshop on the 26th of October and at the commission meeting on November 7th. And in preparation for completing this report, the commission is asked to provide direction regarding operational hours for that new room restroom facility. Um, and at this time, the permanent facility on the western side of Town Park does not have operational hours. So I just wanted to make that reference. Um, staff recommends also making this new restroom available at all times just to promote use and awareness that it's open. Um, and then uh, should vandalism become a concern for the new facility, staff requests that Parks and Recreation Commission, the Planning Commission and Town Council defer to staff to define the operational hours around planned programming um, in the park, such as youth soccer, adult softball and town led special events. Um, there's no fiscal impact associated with um, there was this recommendation. Um, should the project be approved, there's a little bit more detail of where we've already out outlined some of the, the money to be funded from. Um, related to the work plan, as I said, this is a category one council priority. Um, and then the options tonight is uh, recommend the town project as proposed by staff to the Planning Commission, um, recommend it with modifications or provide additional direction to staff. Any questions? We've got two experts on here too. So in addition to me, <laughs> I've done a lot of the aesthetics research and deep dive on the websites, but uh, we've got RJ and Steve available. Um, thank you, Ashley. Uh, I see that the, the single occupancy is taking up more space and more cost. Do you have a, a sense of how much more cost for the six singles versus the so Steve, I'm going to defer to you on that one because we didn't um, have public restroom company um, cost spec all of it because there was a lot of, it would have been a large range, yeah. um, but maybe Steve has got a little bit better information so that we can understand the differences. Yes, uh, good evening, town commissioners. Uh, pricing wise, I mean, obviously the, the footprint uh, grows and the space, the occupancy space grows with options C and D. Um, I would say a rough estimate, those buildings will on average will probably be um, about a hundred, uh, hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars more, uh, just because of the increase of um, sinks, toilets, um, and overall space of the building. Thank you. I have a few questions. Sure. Um, has the orientation of the building been discussed already? Where it would be front facing is the trussing facing south? My proposal is that the trussing is facing the parking lot. So kind of at an angle a little bit, um, but that hasn't been refined. It's something that we're hoping that through um, CAD drawings and CAD design with the, um, the image that we can play with that a little bit and give a better sense to the commission and to, to anybody providing public comment. Because I think that that gives a sense of who it's serving, mm -hmm. right? Where, where it faces. Yeah, and that and also with having the multiple ways to access the facility, um, that was also highlighted so that we have the ability for um, say a parent that's out on the East field and they send a ch one child to the restroom, they could maintain that line of sight while they're maintaining a line of sight of their child doing another child doing something else. That was important to us from your discussion. I have a couple other questions mm -hmm. if I can just keep going. Um, is the uh, 
is this um, the concrete blocks? What are we calling them here? Is is that the cinder block? The cinder block is, is that part of the prefab? What is included as part of the the um, public restroom company's design, or would it be possible to con to have a continuity of the the cedar and the ledge stone to just have a a more um, I think integrated look as opposed to going to another another um, material? No, that's a great question, um, Steve. Defer to you. Since all of our designs include the cinder block alcove. Correct. Yeah, we, so we specialize mostly in cinder block built restrooms, uh, mostly for the for the purpose of uh, resiliency to, to vandalism. So what you see there is, as far as the cedar, uh, it would be applied to the exterior of the cinder block, um, kind of as a, a, a wainscoat. So that answers your question. Well, so the question I think is really, could that also be continued into the alcove? Because I know that we've seen different models or different design options that have like a tile alcove. So could the cinder could the cinder block be also covered with the wainscoting that can continuous with the outside of the building? Oh, sorry. So to answer that question, uh, it's it would actually be rather difficult just because of the mating surfaces of the drinking fountain, uh, the bottle filler. Uh, those all need to be smooth surfaces. So as you bring those other uh, materials in there, uh, it makes it harder to actually adhere those to uh, the alcove. Uh, it also uh, like if you put the the lap siding in there, if there's any splashing. Um, those tend to uh, have the ability to weather quicker. So uh, the CMU block has, uh, has actually been a lot more favorable for our clients over time. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of other questions about lighting um, as it relates to having it open at all hours. Are there going to be motion activated lights or something that would um, indicate if there is activity around the restrooms, particularly late at night when we might want to have a sense of whether or not there are people using the bathrooms for use of the bathrooms or for other purposes. I think it would be helpful to know, you know, that that there was some activity happening and a signal to the community or to the police who might be around. And again, I'll just serve, I'll uh, defer to Steve. But right now we have the time sensor, the time timed lightings. But you have you make an, another version that would be uh, motion lighting as well. Is that correct? Correct. There is an option for these lights. Uh, these are LED lights. They're dark sky lights. Um, so they have a limited projection outwards, uh, more so focused uh, close to the building. But there is an option to make them uh, motion censored. Uh, as it says right now, I think we're mostly talked about having them set off of a photo cell. So as the sun goes down, the lights kick on and stay on. And right now, Steve, I, I know that we have the LED lights over each of the access points as well as in the alcove. Um, are there lights in, internal also? Correct. There's lights inside each of the uh, the restroom stalls. Um, each of those lights will be uh, high mounted on the walls. They are vandal resistant. They are LED and they are motion censored as well. So as occupants come in, in and out of the restroom, those lights will automatically kick on. Okay, two more questions. Sorry, <laughs> the uh, step stools are those for the sinks for kids or to for the toilets? So I'll take that one because I kind of <laughs> threw that one out to Steve and to RJ. Um, if you've been to Target with children and you go into the restroom, there is the metal um, steps that you can push down with your feet, and the kids can stand on there. So as a parent, you're not holding a child and trying to wash their hands at the same time. That was my addition and request to have that put in okay, there. So, at so the they six. flip up. Yeah, at the yeah, six. Okay. Okay. But we're, and we're not doing anything with lower toilets for no. lower kids. We're going to do a stand. We're, we're proposing a standard toilet size, All right. toilet height. Great. Thank you. One last question. And it's the outdoor sink that's on that cinder block wall. Is it just a water? Um, it's just for water or is there also going to be soap and some sort of way to, for people to dry their hands there? Is it really um, a that's a great question station? with the, with the drying option. I don't think we have a drying option there, but um, the, the anticipation was to, to do a full wash. So would that come with a soap, Steve, or is that an option? Uh, as, as drawn right now, it's just the sink, but we can also include a, a soap dispenser. Um, and we also could include a highly vandal resistant uh, hand dryer or the hand dryer itself. All the mechanical pieces would be mounted inside the chase area. And all you would have is basically a vent with a push button on the exterior. So we have multiple options that we could uh, we could imply here. Thank you. And, um, hi, I'm, I'm gonna just comment a little bit. I, I, I think 
given a lot of those um, hand drying, air dryers can be loud. Um, we'd want to study that further. Is it, um, remind us, Steve, what are the, the, uh, the models you typically offer? It's, just, it's the kinds that we've, you know, pretty commonly see out in, in public restrooms and whatnot. Yeah, um, so the, there's actually two really popular ones. The Dyson Airblade, it's a kind of like a V-blade. It's a stainless steel unit that's mounted on the wall. Um, that is highly popular, more so in um, less vandal prone areas, uh, but it is, it is fairly vandal resistant. And then if you're expecting a lot of vandalism, um, the fast air model uh, is the model that is uh, fully recessed um, into the chase area. And once again, it only has the actual vent uh, outwards along with uh, the press, uh, the push button. So I believe the Dyson air blades are the ones that we have at the existing restroom over next to the tennis courts. And, um, you know, the, they can be fairly loud. So I think just something to be conscious of um, if that's a kind of a serious request. And then just in general to respond to a couple other comments, um, you know, I think um, getting feedback and, and having everyone um, provide their thoughts on general palette, you know, is, is great. And I think that's um, um, perfect. And I think um, the planning commission will, will be a big um, uh, assist, provide a lot of assistance in, in us refining just how um, these colors and um, different textures are integrated into a cohesive design. Um, I had uh, just uh, one quick question. Um, so regarding the cedar uh, planks, uh, I, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. I was just curious to see what kind of um, ongoing maintenance is needed for that, whether it's um, staining and if so, how often is, is that? Do you have any information on, on ongoing expenses if it's every couple of years it needs to be restained or how does that work? So, uh, so what you... I think this is in response to question A with that lap siding that you see there. Is that is that your question is pertaining to that one? On A, that's the siding, yeah. Yep, so that siding is actually a fiberglass reinforced uh, paneling. Uh, so it is a synthetic looking uh, cedar. And so it's painted uh, to match your color choice or color scheme of your preference. And traditionally, um, lately we've had, we've had our, our, our clients stick with a, a paint scheme. There is an option for like a metal resistant overlay, um, but uh, for the least, for, for, the, for, for the utmost part, I mean, painting it on a regular basis if it gets vandalized is, is probably the easiest method of keeping it up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess that was also my question in the case of it getting vandalized, spray painted, drawn on with Sharpies, is it going to hold up to scrubbing, power washing, or would we end up just having a building with patches painted over? Um, it sounds like it's pretty sturdy and something that we would pick a paint color and then actually paint the siding versus staining it. Am I, am I correct in that? Correct. Yeah, it is a, it is a pre-manufactured uh, fiberglass uh, board. Um, it's about an inch, a little more than an inch thick. Um, in design, it is very hard, very resilient uh, to abrasion. Um, and typically painting is, is, is sufficient for keeping it, uh, keeping it nice. Um, we do have some clients that do like to do an anti-graffiti coating over uh, so that they can wipe it off with, you know, with their chemical uh, mixture, wipe it off. Uh, I will note that over time, you know, as years go by, the anti-graffiti coating um, as you tend to clean off spots, it tends to change the color a little bit. So lately, uh, we've actually seen, uh, I think, a better, uh, better response with uh, just repainting, color matching the areas as they get uh, graffiti on them. Steve, really quickly, can you just define related to that topic with the wood truss and the combination between the wood truss and using the metal there and how that can be good for anti-graffiti? Yeah, so as far as the, the wood truss, yeah. We, we have several options on how that truss works on the front side. We could do it all wood, we could do it steel, we could do a mixture of the bowl, of, of the two. Um, quite frankly, I think the most popular is the, the upper section to be wood, and then that lower section, the actual vertical posts, 
uh, we're finding uh, clients liking to go with the steel just because it's an easily accessible uh, point for people to take you know, knives to or uh, to paint. Uh, the steel is much easier to maintain uh, on those vertical posts. Makes sense. Yeah, um, I have a, a question, probably not for Steve, but um, those, those dryers are allowed. Well, actually one question, um, there are grids high up under the roof line. Are those open screens? What are those? So Steve can talk to that. I asked yeah. him the same thing. Like, can animals get in there or is it bugs <laughs> or leaves? What's the cleaning related to that? And how does it work with the air and the natural light? Yeah, great question. So that area, um, we call it, it's above the door, above the cap beam. The cap beam is that uh, horizontal line that goes up across the top of the doorway and all the way around the building, basically as in, in a circumference of the building. And then right above that is where we have what we call our vent screens. And those screens are, uh, are sized and calculated uh, based on the size of the, each, each of the restrooms, each of the stalls um, and occupancy. So you'll notice that on the top, uh, kind of above the door, there's a screen there. And then there's also a screen on the side wall, um, a smaller one that allows for uh, basically cross traffic of air to go in and exit the restroom and keep fresh air uh, constantly flowing through the restroom. Uh, as far as the question about uh, insects and animals, insects can get in, um, uh, but they can also get out through it. Uh, they can also get out through the door. Um, and then on, uh, as far as birds or smaller uh, animals, the space itself is about, uh, each, one, each one of the cross-sectional layers is about an inch. So it's, it's typically too small for a bird uh, to get inside there. Um, and rodents, I think, would have a much easier time trying to get through underneath the door uh, than trying to climb that high. So I, I haven't heard any negative effects of it. Uh, it seems to be a good sizing that's worked out for a lot of our clients. Um, I was just wondering about noise of hand dryers. The, I know the restrooms over by the tennis courts are open, you know, and I've definitely seen groups of teenagers hanging out in there in the evenings. Um, do we get noise complaints from the people who live across Pixley? It's, I guess it's down more by the post office and not too close to any residences, but I'm just a little concerned about noise of hand dryers and things like that in the evening in this new restaurant with the houses on Mohawk and across Tamil Pius. Um, no complaints of um, hand dryer sounds um, from the existing restroom. Yeah, okay. Have reached me. I can't imagine that the restroom dryers would be any louder than any of the athletics going on in the fields. Yeah, I'm just thinking about two o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, somebody's in there. I guess I'm curious about why keep it open 24 hours a day versus close it late evening, you know, until dawn or something. Yeah, and it's, it's great question. If the commission wants to make an amendment to uh, the recommendation, all ears, this is really your, your community and you know what would work best for the users of the park at all hours. Um, I think you you each have been in the park at different hours than I have, so I know that your level of time on the fields is much more than mine. Um, the the my recommendation for having it open is merely just to try to get people to utilize restroom facilities that are designed for restrooms rather than um, some of the behaviors that are going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and existing, we have the portables that are open at all times as well as the other restrooms. And so far, things have gone you know fairly well, and people have been very respectful. So I thought maybe give the community the benefit of the doubt at the beginning, and if we have to you know pull back and redefine, then we could. But it's up to you. But there are no more questions. Uh, one, one just quick question. Um, I, I kind of have a feeling this is um, obvious, but uh, in the 3D rendering, it looks like there's a step up here, but this is going to be level for um, wheelchair accessibility, correct? Correct. Thank you. So before we go to commission discussion, let's see if there are any public comments. Thank you, Chair Miles. I am checking emailed public comment. Um, we did not receive any emailed public comment on this item, and we do have two participants with raised hands. So let me restart the, ah, 
may we start the timer video and I will call on uh, James Jordan. Mr. Jordan, you should. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Say, um, so uh, option A and B versus option C and D. In uh, A and B, there are four um, different rooms, uh, two private in the back, and then in the front, a men's and a women's room, and they, they each have two units in them, two toilets or a toilet and a urinal. And then in the uh, C and D, there are six individual rooms, two of them a little larger for having a child in there or um, changing clothes or something. And so I, I'm wondering how this works out practically in that um, at times the park's very quiet and other times it can be very busy with a lot of people there. So in the A and B option in the front two family restrooms, uh, if I go in there, then um, there will not be a lock on the inside of the door like there might be on the individual six units so that uh, somebody else can come in. Is that correct? No, there'll be locks on all the doors. So if I go in there and I lock the door, then even though we have four units in there um, to use, um, nobody else can get in. So maybe does that effectively reduce uh, yeah. the number of people who can use the restroom? Because even though there are okay. two toilets in there, only one person so can get in at a time. Yeah. So to clarify, you can lock the stall door within the men's and the women's room where there is more than one toilet. And then there is the single person or, or family toilets. So it, it, the family room then, there, you could not lock the main entry door from the inside. You should be able to lock the, for the all gender restrooms, you will be able to lock the door from the inside. For the women's room that has two toilets, they will have stall doors that will lock. Okay, and, and the main door go, coming in, no lock on that from the inside. No lock, there correct. No, correct. It has a time okay, lock thank you. should we decide to close the facility in the future. Okay, thank you. Hopefully the um, the expanded image on the, the Zoom right now, you can help, it will help you see a little bit better. I apologize for not having it up earlier. Okay. okay. Um, does that conclude your questions, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the next person I will call on is Patty Stolier. Patty, you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yep, thanks. Great, thank um, you. So my question is, uh, I heard reference to, no, we're not gonna have short toilets. Are we gonna have elevated toilets with grab bars for seniors? All the toilet heights are the same. Um, Steve, I can defer to you on grab bars and accessibility for ADA. Yeah, all of the required uh, ADA uh, grab bars and clearance spaces uh, will all be adhered to for this, this restroom. Uh, toilet heights will be the standard heights uh, and uh, obviously meet the ADA standard for those toilets. I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but I'm pretty sure that means these are the grab bars right here. On the okay, so, but not an elevated height, just a standard height. Correct. Thank you. So bringing it back to the commission for discussion, um, Ashley has asked for kind of direction from us to kind of help her move forward for bringing this to the planning commission. Um, she has recommended the spot near the water fountains, um, design A and operational hours to be left to staff, kind of keeping an eye on whether we have issues. Open it up to the commission for discussion if there is something we want to direct her differently than those three. Um, I personally would agree with, with the recommendations from the staff. I think um, the location we talked about at length at previous meetings and the design seems to fit the needs appropriately with fiscal responsibility. Um, and I think that the hours, I, I also shared Commissioner Elson's concerns about the overnight, but I think staff knows better than we do of what's currently happening with the current facilities. And I, and I think I agree with, with Ashley, give it a, give it a go. We can always change that. 
And certainly with the different, those events and hours different that might complicate things. So we want them, want it to be available for everyone when they need it. Yeah, I would agree as well. This is going to be a tremendous amenity for the park and for everybody who uses the facilities um, year round. So I'm really excited to see this moving forward. So Ashley, please proceed with your recommendations. Congratulations on taking in a lot of different feedback and managing to find something that will minimize the footprint and the grass that we lose and the budget. Well Thank done. you. Thank you for the opportunity. And our second business item. RJ and Steve, thank you. Thank you, RJ. Thank you. Steve. All right. Discussion and possible action to set commission meeting calendar for 2023. So annual, annually, we talk about any conflicting dates um, based on holidays or knowing some um, personal conflicts. Um, so right now we have a direct conflict with December 25th being a meeting date on the fourth Monday. And also we have a possible uh, conflict with September 25th being Yom Kippur. Um, so I wanted the commission's um, advice and recommendation on how to proceed with those dates. Um, if you look on um, the attachment one, which is the proposed dates and then notes next to it, and you'll see on September 25th, the staff notes that Yom Kippur is observed typically sunset on Sunday, September 24th through nightfall of Monday, September 25th. And the commission may, be, may decide to cancel the meeting on September 25th now or defer it to a later decision. Um, regarding uh, November 27th, staff recommends canceling the regular meeting on November 27th due to proximity to Thanksgiving. Um, right now, Thanksgiving is the November 23rd. Um, and the, over the last few years, we've combined the November and December meetings um, to avoid, the, again, the Thanksgiving holiday, but then to have um, the December meeting earlier in the month. So that would be December 4th, if we're keeping in line with the last two years. Um, so both are open for um, staff or uh, for uh, Commission consideration. Um, so the actions tonight is to consider canceling the regular meetings um, scheduled for November 27th and December 25th and schedule a special meeting on Monday, December 4th um, or provide additional direction to staff. I personally would um, agree with the cancellation of the November and December meetings and the dates that they fall on for the reasons that you explained and having the earlier December meeting. Um, I would suggest that we talk about whether or not we hold the September 25th meeting, potentially just pushing it a week back and maybe moving the October meeting a week back as well, just because we don't know what activity and, and issues may be before the commission at that time, it would be hard to cancel September and November and try to get a lot of our work done in a um, for shortened number of meetings at the back half of the year. So one possibility would be just making our September meeting the first week of October, making that October meeting the first week of November, and then having the, uh, the December meeting the first weekend of December. So we still have a number of meetings in the back half if we have master plan or other activities. That we need to talk about. And related to that, I know that we, I, I had asked um, Rebecca to check the meeting schedule to see if it conflicts with any other boards and commissions. Um, and I'm not sure about the next week that there might've been conflict, but I think the next day was a possibility for September. Um, so that's something to consider, or we can make those adjustments as, uh, as we get closer to that time period, knowing what the possible agenda items might be. I would, I would agree with the November, December, that feels very easy. And okay, we're all agreed on that. Um, so now it's a question of September and October, we could potentially move September back a day or consider moving both meetings back a week. I would favor probably trying to do as little change to the regular cadence of the meetings as we can if shifting it a day would work and we can have quorum. And I think that it actually it's wise to, I mean, we can, to see what might be coming is also nice. I mean, we're nine months away from that. If it looks like back things are all tucked in and it's okay, maybe it allows for cancellation versus we need to meet and find a date. Would be my reference. So I think that the goal is to try and move the September meeting off of the 25th. Mm -hmm. So whether it's one day 
or if both meetings move out a week, we can defer to Ashley to take a look at calendars and figure out which is the least disruptive mm -hmm. path forward. Okay. Recognizing that maybe September doesn't need to happen at all, although there's a lot on here. And if we combine the November, December, it would be December 4th? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Because Hanukkah starts December 7th. So that's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's consistent with the last two years of plan, which is the recommendation. Do we have any public comment on the meeting schedule? I do not see any raised hands um, and we did not receive any emailed public comments. Um, but from, from staff's perspective, the day after your September meeting is a Tuesday and the first and third Tuesdays are council meetings and the second and fourth Tuesdays are planning commission meetings. So we'd have to look elsewhere during the week or possibly a Monday if you wanted to reschedule that one. Okay, Wednesdays? Wednesday is a possibility except for the third Wednesday of the month is our climate action committee meeting day. Is 927 the third Wednesday of the month? It should be the fourth. Great, that's what I figured. Yeah, okay. So we could do 927. I like it. Does that look good to your schedule, Rebecca, for the room? Um, I believe so, but I don't have all the windows open where I would check on something like that. Um, Staff can confirm at a later time to confirm. I, I think it should be okay, though. Great. Somebody like to make a motion? Yes, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, and since I have the opportunity to mention that, um, I believe given the action items on the agenda, we're the same for 5A and 5B, we should have taken a motion for 5A as well. Okay. Um, so we might need to go back and reopen that item and take a formal motion since you didn't uh, do that previously, but I will do the vote for 5B right now. It is uh, Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Elson? Yes. Commissioner Kenig? Yes. Commissioner Phipps absent. Uh, Commissioner Rose? Yes. Commissioner Blumling is absent. Commissioner Charlie. Um, Chair Miles? Yes. Okay, thank you. And can I get a motion to approve 5A as recommended by staff? I will make a motion to approve item 5A as recommended by staff regarding the Town Park restroom project. Second. And Rebecca, can we get a vote, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Elson? Yes. Commissioner Kenick? Yes. Commissioner Phipps? Commissioner Rose? Yes. Commissioner Blumling? Vice Chair Charlie? Chair Miles? Yes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to staff updates and commissioner reports. Ashley? Let me just pull up the next screen. Okay, uh, quickly, my director's report for this evening, um, active older adult uh, programs and activities. Uh, we have ongoing programs offered every day of the week. Mondays are two fitness classes, average 10 participants in each class. Tuesdays are group walks and women's club book programs. Wednesdays are yoga, which is about 20 participants and growing. Thursdays is typically our senior day. So we've got bingo that attracts about 15 people plus the um, in-person senior lunches, which is 20. And then we have bridge, which is 15 people. And then bridge classes, we have 11 signups for intermediate bridge that started last week. Um, Fridays, we have monthly um, AARP classes and seniors in balance. And those are typically once a month. Um, the Corner Madeira Children's Center, December registration numbers for the first through fifth grades, we had 61. Kindergarten full-time, 23. Kindergarten part-time, 18. January registrations are up to 64 for first through fifth, uh, 24 for kindergarten full-time, and 14 for kindergarten part-time. And uh, staff Alex and Alex wanted to give a heads up that uh, they'll be holding their donut party for the kids on Friday the 27th, which includes face paint, tattoos, and dance parties. Um, this is something they do like an incentive board. So as the kids are doing well, um, they do an incentive chore chart, uh, essentially. Um, so they've had different parties, uh, which has been really fun to see. Um, and they'll also be offering three days of full care for the midwinter break, which will be uh, February 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. 
um, after school enrichment classes. Most of the semester classes started uh, last week and then this week, and those are taking place at both campuses at, at Neil Cummins, the Cove, as well as our dance studio, um, and then locations around Town Park and in the community center. Um, adults with developmental disabilities, they uh, Rec Inc. is still going on. They've got something um, at least a couple times a month. They've got Monday basketballs. They've got um, third Friday dances, and then they have the um, Larkspur Lions. And I think they're preparing for um, their their dinner at Celia's, which is an annual event. Um, art exhibitions. Uh, December we had the invitational, the second invitational, and then we added the painted bins program, which was um, a composting project in our project that was done at Neil Cummins. Um, so we had about 50, um, 50 paintings from uh, adults, and then we had about 16 posters from the youth, and it was a really cool combination of events where we had inter, um, you know, intergenerational kids there. We had um, the artists that, you know, some of them take themselves quite seriously, some of them were new to being exhibiting artists, and then we had the kids that were so excited to see their posters displayed, and their posters were mostly done in collaboration, so there was a couple that were done by one student, but most of them were two or three students. Um, and so the kids really liked being there and having their, their work on display, but the, um, the more mature artists also really loved having the kids there because they were able to talk it up and there was a whole different energy and vibe to, to those, um, reception events. And then thanks again to, uh, the Ray Simpson trio for doing a live music at the closing and for the Lions for co-sponsoring both reception events and having the bar open. And then we provided ref light refreshments also. Um, January right now we have the California Watercolor Association member show and that's a juried show so there's a juror of selection a juror of awards so they have the awards uh, presentation as well as we'll do a people's choice awards and the closing is this Friday the 27th so from five to seven again the lines are helping us to co-sponsor the reception event and then the Ray Simpson trio will be back so it's really great to have the live music there um, and there's about 38 paintings right now um, each artist has two paintings there and um, at the first reception, which was a really stormy night, um, we still had attracted 51 people, so that was really great. Uh, so we're hoping for much more this time. Um, upcoming activities or recap of activities events. We had the coat drive that was between November and December. We had about 20, 250 to 300 coats and Amine at the front desk led that project. And then um, Perry uh, was supporting the letters to Santa and there are about 50 letters received. Um, and they were all responded to and mailed back before December 18th, before the closure. Um, update on the master plan process is that staff's looking forward to sharing at a future commission meeting, maybe as early as the February commission meeting, um, some of the draft uh, results of the facilities condition assessment. And again, that was in assessing the existing facilities, both um, the parks, um, playgrounds, athletic fields, as well as the indoor facilities. So the community center, the dance room, and then also um, the way that we're utilizing the portable spaces at Neil Cummins. Um, so it's gonna be a really great opportunity to see some of the deficiencies and some of the deferred maintenance that we should have been addressing. Um, maybe some things that we already knew, um, but possibly some things that we needed to make sure that are up to code and things that we hadn't realized that could take some priority in our planning and recommendations to council. But then also evaluating from there what our opportunities are. So knowing what our community needs and desires are from community engagement and the survey is being able to take it to that next level and being able to help us uh, from a consultants and experts perspective of of how we continue to meet and um, anticipate some of the needs of our community and make sure that our facilities and our programming are, are there and ready to address that. Um, so it's very exciting and they'll be able to add a dollar value to it. So it's gonna be able to really help us make that solid recommendation to council for consideration and prioritization. So come in soon. And that concludes my directors. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Commissioner updates. I am up for the December meetings. So Town Council 12-6 um, meeting was a um, reformation of the council where um, Mayor Lee was elected, appointed, um, confirmed, and Vice Mayor Beckman, um, and the appointment of Adam Wolf as town manager. Um, so it was a pretty short meeting. And then the 1220 meeting, Ashley was, um, did her presentation of the programs, which we have seen, excellent. Um, the fee resolution was approved, which is very exciting. Um, in relationship to the programs, um, there was some interest from council members around um, cost and the dances, kind of how we're collaborating with 
uh, the Larkspur Parks and Rec, as well as with the um, you know, Generational Center, and then more conversation on scholarships, which we have brought back. Um, and then related to the fee resolution, just kind of understanding the employee discount um, and recognizing that you know the 25% is appropriate. Um, and that was the key pieces of the December meetings. Uh, January meetings. Um, so I uh, was not able to attend in person, but I um, listened to the recording. There wasn't much uh, as it pertains to Parks and Rec, um, but there was uh, uh, basically uh, some information given out on open gov uh, software for finance uh, financial transparency um, that was gone over. Um, There's a lot of discussions about budgeting um, and changes uh, to the budget, uh, various um, budgeting, but nothing that pertained to uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, AJ, uh, or I'm sorry, RJ uh, gave a uh, good uh, breakdown of a lot of the um, emergency response, uh, the damage that was done during uh, a lot of the rain. Um, I think we kind of lucked out uh, in comparison to some other counties uh, around the Bay Area. Um, but I, he did mention that there's about four hundred dollars to five hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. Nothing uh, in any of our parks. A lot of it was uh, pipes, mudslides. I'm sure, we've kind of uh, read a little bit uh, in the news about it. Uh, and then lastly, um, there was discussion about the Tam Drive freeway, uh, freeway overpass uh, project. Um, they're just working with um, so Caltrans, um, negotiating what that's going to look like, um, soliciting feedback. Um, there was ongoing conversation from uh, the mayor finding out what options we have uh, as far as making it look nice or if it's basically a cookie cutter approach. Um, so it's still, you know, high level discussions there and there was major decisions made. But that's about everything. In the January meeting. The executive advisory committee did not meet since our last meeting. Um, are there individual commissioner updates? The only one I have is that I had promised to come back to this group related to pools and expenses um, with kind of a little bit of a better understanding about where that fits within our priorities and how we think about that. And again, we had talked about 20 to 30 million dollars initial investment plus an ongoing investment um, and just kind of have a little bit better understanding of where um, the town is in terms of the investment in town hall being $10 million that we have a gap in the Caltran project um, of $12 million of which the town has put forward $3 million. So there's a gap that we are you know, still trying to find. And then there are the fire station updates, which may come in around $20 million in terms of needing to upgrade those. Um, and prior in terms of purchasing land and investments, the you know, prioritization of housing and that kind of mandate from the state being kind of a challenging thing to, to work through as we think about that. Um, given all of that, my recommendation to the commission is that we pause on the exploration on pools um, for now. Getting knots. Okay, that was my update. That is the close of update. Routine and other matters. Discussion of potential future agenda items. Are there anything, topics that we would like to add to future agenda items? All right. Commissioner Blundling is up for the uh, town council meetings for February. If there's nothing else, we will close this meeting. Thank you so much for your attendance and participation.